Thank you. So, the story that I wanted to tell you <coughs> about today is a story that deals with uh, mysteries that we have with some certain unusual materials. And uh, I'm not a material scientist, I'm actually a cold atom physicist, so I don't really have anything to do with uh, these materials and shouldn't be meddling around with them. But there's a new branch of cold atom physics that's called quantum simulations, which is making a connection between these two fields. And the term quantum simulations, we actually credit um, Richard Feynman with to have defined it about 30 years ago in a famous lecture that he got, gave on the physics of computation. And he summed up the motivation of why we would have, want to have something like this uh, nicely in the end of that talk in the following way. He said, nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it a quantum mechanical one. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look easy. <laughs> All right. So it's not an easy problem. So let's have a look. What is the kind of materials that are giving us these problems? And what is the issue that uh, Richard Feynman was talking about in this case? Let me give you an example of one of these materials. And you've all heard about it. It's called the high temperature superconductor. And it's a material that's conducting electric power without any losses. So obviously, it's very useful. And we're using it a lot on everyday basis for technical applications. However, the embarrassing fact is that for high temperature superconductors, even 25 years after we found them, we still don't really know how they work. And of course, we know a tremendous lot about them by now, after 25 years. So for, for example, we have taken them apart, and we do know what they look like on the inside. And this is what you can see in the bottom right. And they consist of a crystal structure of different types of atoms that are uh, in some regular arrangement. All right, I can, what's even worse, I can actually give you the formula that we think contains everything that we need to know about high temperature superconductivity. And as you can see, it's not terribly complicated. It's just a bunch of, um, a bunch of letters. And <laughs> it, would <laughs> it would seem that you could solve something like this. But in 25 years, unfortunately, we have not been able to. So what is inside this formula? It's actually quite simple. So it's, what it's describing is simply this lattice that we have been talking about, this regular array of atoms. And on the sides of these lattices, there are electrons. And the electrons have a spin and an orientation which can rotate. And in addition, these electrons can actually move around the lattice by tunneling from one side to the next. That is all. All right. But we cannot solve it analytically. Today, we have very powerful computers. So why don't we do a, a computer simulation and put all of this into a computer and see where the high temperature superconductivity comes out? Unfortunately, and this is the problem that Richard Feynman was talking about, this is also not possible for as far as we know today. And the reason is that this is fundamentally a quantum mechanical problem. And in quantum mechanics, the electrons are not necessarily at one given location, for example, but they can be in several states in several locations at the same time. And this means that if you put several electrons, you have to take care in the memory of this computer that you're using, take care of all the possible combinations of positions that you can imagine at the same time. And this number of possible combinations is a number that increases very quickly when you increase the number of electrons that you're looking at. And in fact, this is so quickly that if you take the most powerful computers today that take the power of an entire small city, um, you cannot simulate a system that is larger, even in a simple case, than about 40 electrons, which is not enough for us. And if you want to do something that is only 300 electrons, so still really tiny, this computer would have to be larger than the size of the entire universe in order to store all this data. <laughs> all right. So a problem that requires a computer that is larger than the universe? Well, <laughs> let's try to solve it anyway. That sounds like fun. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this is um, what Feynman's answer in his talk is what we should do in this case. And this is wh what you heard. The idea is to make the simulator itself quantum mechanical so that the simulator itself can go into a superposition of states and it can take care of all these different combinations of individual electron states at the same time by somehow being in itself in the same number of configurations simultaneously. Now, unfortunately, we don't have quantum computers so far. And um, we would even need quite a sizable one for this. And this is still pretty far out. But so we try to do it anyway. And the idea is to make a quantum simulator, which is basically a system that is designed for simulating a very specific type of quantum mechanics problem and be very optimized for this. And the way how we do this is by making the simulator, giving it the same structure, basically, as the problem that the problem has, and basically encoding the problem into the hardware. 
So what kind of structure would this computer, this simulator have to have? So of course, the fundamental thing is this uh, twist the lattice structure. And as an atomic physicist, we work a lot with lasers. We know very well how to make perfect periodic structures. And that is for, by using just a laser beam <coughs> and interfering it with itself in a standing wave. And you get this perfect sinusoidal uh, patterns of light in this way. And then we can use atoms. And if we put an atom into such a sinusoidal light pattern, it sees the light, standing light waves as a series of barriers and will be placed in the middle, in the, in the rooms between these barriers. And due to quantum mechanics, it will be able, under certain circumstances, to tunnel from one side to, through the barrier to the next. Uh, the interesting thing is that if we are able to realize this system, then for low enough energies, we can mathematically show that this physical implementation corresponds exactly to the formula that we were interested in. And so we are basically making a physical manifestation of this formula in order to solve it. Okay, and we will just have it there and look at what it's doing, and it will give the, simulation, the solution for us. Well, that, of course, sounds a bit too good to be true, so, so there must be a catch. And the catch is the low enough energies. So in order to get to these low enough energies, we need to have very, very cold temperatures. We need to use ultra-cold atoms. And this is where the atomic physics comes in, and the cold atom physics, because we, the temperatures we are talking about is in the nano-Kelvin range, which is many billion times colder than the superconductor was in the first place, which was already quite a cold object. And nano-Kelvin is basically the, the range of the coldest objects ever known at all. It's the territory of both Einstein condensates and these degenerate quantum gases of uh, atomic physics. And this is what we'll use in order to make our simulator. So in order to, of course, realize the entire um, system in the way, the, the crystal in the way that you've seen, we need to make more than one sending wave. So we can do two to get a two-dimensional system. And with three of these standing waves, we get a geometry that is very similar to this crystal lattice that you've seen before. And uh, this is going to be our simulator. All right, this is the schematics. Let's go to the lab and actually do it. For these super cold temperatures, we, of course, can't have an ambient, ambient air, air, so they need to be in the vacuum. For this, we surround our atoms with uh, glass walls on all sides that we shine the lasers through. And then we add a whole a lot of vacuum systems, a big uh, setup full of vacuum pumps and magnetic coils and atom sources around this to generate the cold atoms that we want. And uh, finally, we need <laughs> a large amount of laser and electronics gadgets, a whole truckload full in the end. Which we, uh, with, with which we surround this apparatus in order to make our measurements. So then we still need something. And what we need is we need a way to be able to look inside our apparatus to see the result that our device has now given us. right? And um, over the years, many different methods have been developed. Well, over the last few years, um, many different methods have been developed to do this. And I'm going to show you only one, which I find the most spectacular. And this is by just simply using an optical microscope, as you know it, and integrating it with our vacuum setup. So basically, we have a, a microscope pointed at, our, at the planes of our lattice, and our atoms are located in such a way that we can see them directly by just sticking a camera um, to this microscope. And um, then, if we make a good enough microscope, we'll be able to see each lattice side individually. And indeed, this can be done, and if you look through this microscope, you see something like this. So this is an ensemble of uh, many thousand atoms, and each of the green dots that you can see is one of these atoms. And um, of course, as an atomic physicist, when you see those and you can see your atoms eye to eye, that is, of course, amazing. And you can even zoom in, and uh, what you will see then is that you see these little Tetris pieces in the structure of, of, of these uh, pieces up there. And the reason for this is, of course, the lattice structure. We are on a rectangular lattice here that is um, uh, on which all these atoms are aligned. All right, but we can do something even crazier. We can go and we can switch on the video, and we can see our atoms actually moving live on the screen while they are jumping around in this lattice. And this is, of course, when you stop all reasonable work and you uh, go and tell your colleagues and have a look at this. <laughs> this is so cool, you need to see this. <laughs> and they come and they also stop working. And um, so. <clears throat> But they're going to tell you, um, wait a second, you're cheating here. You cannot watch a quantum process going on, because these superpositions that we talked about 
when you measure them, they decay to a single state. So this is not a quantum simulator, this is just a simulator. Okay? All right. So this we cannot do. And the reason where these superpositions come from in this case is the following. When an atom tunnels, it's not really moving from one side to exactly one other side. But what it can do is, during this tunneling, it can end up on several sides at the same time, being in a superposition. In fact, the preferred way for the atom to be is to be in a superposition between all of the sides of the lattice, to be everywhere at the same time. And the atoms that we are using, in fact, can not only tunnel through the lattice, but they can tunnel through each other even. And this means that, uh, independently of each other, they will all be in all locations at the same time. Now, if you may take a measurement of this system, what you, this, what you will find is a random location of each of these atoms, and there's no way to predict where they will end up. Then Neville Mott, 60 years ago, looked at this, and he found that there's a another, way, another thing that can also happen under certain circumstances. And he looked at this because at that time, they had a problem that was similar to the one that we're having now with the superconductors. They had found a class of materials which they thought should be uh, conductors, but in fact, they were insulators. And Mott was able to solve the formula for that case, which al looks almost exactly the same as the one you saw. And what he found was that in that case, the atoms are actually all localized on a single lattice site and um, due to interactions between these, uh, between these atoms or electrons, so in, in reality it's electrons. In our, um, the, so therefore, what happens is in our simulator, the atoms will all be localized to a single side, and each side will therefore be filled with, uh, when we make the measurement, will be filled with a single atom, and we see nice full uh, lattice full of um, particles. So let's do that experiment. So this, now you see a new frame every time. So the tunneling atoms appear in random locations and you see them flashing up and down. And we're slowly increasing the interaction. And what happens is that you see these domains forming where the lattice is actually filled and the atoms are localized to certain lattice sites and can no longer tunnel. And of course, that means that in that case, compared to before where everything was freely able to tunnel, the system has become an insulator. No more flux is taking place in such a system. Now, of course, we would love to do the same kind of experiment to look at the superconductors, and we're hoping to do so soon. There's still a bunch of technical issues where we need to get better, for example, reach even lower temperatures. But there's not just, just, not just this type of uh, simulation that we're doing, but you can, with these, if you look at arrays of atoms of this kind, you can think of all, other, all kinds of other things that you could do with them. And something that is a very, a very interesting and a very new development is something that you could say, all right, if I have a microscope like this, I can not only look through it, I can also send a beam backwards, and the microscope will focus this beam very well. And in that way, I can shine light at individual atoms, and if I do it right, they can stay, change their internal state, and they will, uh, for example, switch from a visible atom to a transparent atom. And the guys at the Max Planck Institute in, in Munich have done this very recently, and they've managed to realize this and be able to now write random patterns into this um, atom array, basically, and putting the atoms in arbitrary states that uh, they want with pretty good fidelity. So, <clears throat> of course, this makes you think directly of some sort of computer, right? So this looks like a memory that's a bit here on, every, uh, on, on each of these sites. And in fact, when we go back to the t famous talk 30 years ago by uh, Richard Feynman, this was already a system that he envisioned and described in this talk as a way to do computations. So what he was envisioning was exactly this thing. He thought that it should be a computer where the numbers are represented by a row of atoms with each atom in either of the two states. And he called this a computer that could not be made more smaller and could not be more elegant. Now, of course, it would be awesome to take a system like this and put in the uh, missing ingredients and make a general quantum computer out of this uh, quantum simulator that can uh, compute anything, and, but that is one, one thing that people want to do in this field, of course. And uh, on the other side, we are gaining more and more insight using these kinds of methods into these material science problems, into the problem of many electrons that are interacting. And our hope is that very soon we will be able to understand these um, complicated quantum materials much better with methods like this, and then maybe be able to improve them, make a superconductor that works at a higher temperature, for example, once we understand how exactly they work internally. And then, in the, in the long run, we are dreaming of even more crazy things, like, for example, imagining um, that we could invent, using the quantum simulator, a material that has new quantum effects that don't even exist today in nature, but um, which we could then try to realize 
in, as, as a real crystal. So this field of physics has only just begun and it will certainly just stay interesting for a very long time. Thank you very much.